Our subject today, retirement. Don't go away. Retirement means something different now than it did 50 years ago. The book is Revolutionary Retirement, What's Next for You? The author is Catherine Allen. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We, uh, we're talking about retirement today, but retirement might not seem what you think retirement means. Let me read from the forward to your book here. We are living longer lives. We are living healthier lives. We are living fuller lives. We have more choices, more options, and more possibilities than any generation in history. But we share one thing in common with every generation. We are not prepared for these new realities. We're talking about retirement here. Now, retirement doesn't mean what it used to mean, uh, right? That's correct. Um, the boomers, those born between 1946 and 1964, were revolutionaries all the way. There's 77 million of us still out there, and no matter what phase of life we've changed as, we've changed the world in the way that uh, they look at um, life. And so we're doing the same thing in terms of retirement. We're reinventing ourselves into a new chapter. We don't even like the R world, word, the retirement word, and we're reinventing what that means. It's very different than our parents or our grandparents. And like you were telling me before we were on the air that even AARP, the group, the American Association of Retired Persons, they're, they've reinvented themselves. That's right. They call uh, their new website is Life Reimagined. And again, it's to look at how you can think about this next phase of your life. Instead of calling it retirement, it's true you might leave the career or the job that you had, but most people are reinventing into new work or into new passions or new ways of expressing themselves in this next chapter of life. This book, Revolutionary Retirement, What's Next for You, you wrote it with a number of, of people. How That's did right. you come to write this book? Where did you get the, the why did you end up calling it Revolutionary Retirement? Um, so the, my co-authors are Nancy Berg was a, uh, a national security advisor to Vice President Bush at the White House. Uh, Rita Foley was a president of the Consumer Packaging Division for West Vaco. Nan, uh, uh, Jay Smith is a corporate coach, corporate um, Fortune 500 coach. And we all belong to a women's organization. That's how we met. Um, we all were passionate first in our first book, which is called Reboot Your Life, and it's about taking corporate sabbaticals. We were all passionate about taking time off. And then we, uh, and how that related to creativity and innovation and, and really refreshing yourself. Um, out of that, we did retreats, and we started talking to people in their 40s and 50s and 60s who all said, I don't really want to retire, or I don't like that word, or I don't know what I want to do next. And it was out of that that we then researched around, we talked to about 300 boomers getting ready for retirement, 10,000 a day are turning 65. Um, and we also thought, well, that group has always been revolutionary. They're going to revolutionize retirement. So let's call the book that. And um, we did this. We came out from uh, Create. Uh, we actually did this in Create Space and did it self-publishing. We now have a publisher, Career uh, Press, that has picked it up. And it came through um, a agent who teaches at the Cape Cod Writers Center, the conference, uh, Marilyn Allen, and she introduced, she loved the book and said, let's see if a regular publisher will pick it up, and they are. By the way, if people are interested in finding out more about the Cape Cod Writers Center conference, you can go to the web, capecodwriterscenter.org, and find out more about that. In the meantime, though, we're talking about retirement, revolutionary retirement. One of the things you talk about, this book, by the way, is a practical, like, how-to guide, things right. to think about. It's one of those books you can pick up and just read a page or two, a chapter or two, and it's very readable, very interesting. You have uh, practical practical advice, uh, uh, practical advice and, and uh, exercises that, you, that people can do. But one of the things that you, you talk about here is thinking about retirement, when is the right time? Mm -hmm. When is the right time to retire? When is the right time to start thinking about retiring? Right. Um, well, first of all, 
um, many people are putting off retirement. Every year the percentage gets larger. We used to think of a traditional retirement age at 62 or 65, where we're finding many people working well into their 70s. The time to start thinking about it, however, is when you're younger, when you're maybe in your 40s or 50s or even 30s. You certainly not only need to think about the financial part of it and saving, but you also need to think about where do I want to live or what is it I want to do next or what skills do I have that might allow me to work well into my 70s. And it's interesting, the millennials, the people who are 18 to 30, um, many of them children of the boomers, um, are thinking that way. They are thinking about uh, maybe I want to work someplace for two years or four years. I want to develop these skills. And so they are thinking that they will, that the age 65 means nothing to them. That's interesting because usually when people are in their 30s or their 40s, they're not thinking of retiring right. because it's sometimes difficult to think about what am I going to have for dinner tonight. Yeah. Uh, but why do you think the millennials are more apt to think this way than say the generation, Gen X people or, or boomers? Um, well, first of all, they saw many of their parents lose their jobs or lose their retirement money during the financial crisis that happened between 2008 and 2011. Um, they also saw that um, they, it, it, they have a, a, a self-image of being continually renewing themselves and they're the technology generation. So they, they already can see that they can live in remote places and still write or blog or, or uh, have jobs or do coding for software. So they think about not having to be in a specific place. They see that their parents lost money or, and or lost their jobs during uh, that period. And so they're in a way more conservative about saving money. They have a higher savings rate than the Gen Xers do. That's interesting. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So there's a, that's an optimistic outlook. It, on the they're future. very optimistic, and and they are the ones that also have come into the workforce when there haven't been as been as many jobs, or the jobs haven't had the kind of benefits that a generation ahead of them. So they're both optimistic, but they also kind of take it on their own that they're going to have to earn the money that and save the money that they're going to need in retirement. That's why many of them are entrepreneurial or stud, setting up their own businesses. And one of the things that uh, a lot of uh, folks going into retirement are thinking about, it, it's the money. Will I have right. enough money? Right. And the statistics are not very good at all. That's right. Uh, two statistics that I think are scary. One is, uh, and these are AARP numbers, um, only 25% of boomers have saved enough or even saved anything, which means 75% are either living paycheck to paycheck or don't have enough yet, or there, it might be equity in their home, but they still have to live somewhere. Right. The other statistic <clears throat> is 70% of current boomers are still supporting their adult children in some way. And that means their 30 or 40 year old children with either loans for housing or paying the rent or car, um, paying car payments or even cell phone payments. And they're gonna to have to stop doing that. Uh, one, it sort of enables their children and, and keeps them from taking responsibility yeah. for their own lives. But secondly, they are not gonna have enough in retirement if they're continuing to pay for things now for their kids. Now, parents supporting their kids, that's, that's always been there. But it's a higher percentage these days, is it? It's a higher percentage and for things beyond what you used to think about. I mean, always there's been, you know, parents would leave money, for instance, when they passed away to their children, or they might have helped with their grandchildren's schooling. But today, these are paying for rent, paying for the um, house payments or mortgage payments, paying for uh, things that should be paid for out of an individual's own income. It's sort of the cost of living. And um, part of it is because we, again, the boomers are at fault at yeah. this, is our children want to live the same standards that they had growing up. And it was a, certainly a, a higher standard that they can afford now. And they want to keep living that standard as opposed to living on the incomes that they have.
And you know, when I was young, and the boomers were young, we lived in group houses, you know, to save on rent. You right. would, uh, you didn't go out to eat very much. You certainly didn't take vacations, or if you did, you know, it was a group thing. And that was just how it was. You just were independent and you did that. But today, um, many of those kids want their parents to take the, pay for vacations to go to the Bahamas or go to Europe, and they want to live in a house that's in a nice neighborhood and they want they don't want to share a house or an apartment with somebody else well then then when the parents are subsidizing that again my argument is that's taking money away from their own retirement the book is revolutionary retirement what's next for you we're talking with co-author Catherine Allen about the book today this is books on the world a presentation of the Cape Cod Writers Center so what if somebody doesn't have enough money going into retirement what what then so we have two of the chapters in the book. One is on making your money last, and we give some really pragmatic advice on how to cut back in expenses, how to live more simply, how to trade your house for vacations rather than paying uh, for a hotel, how to maybe bring in uh, rent part of your house or, or bring in a boarder, so to mm -hmm. speak, um, or even live in a communal house and share costs. Uh, so ways to think about sharing costs. Then we have another chapter called Reinventing into Work. And there we talk about the opportunities where people may have if they keep their skills up and their contacts up. And we talk about investing in yourself and how important that is. Um, then there are opportunities. And we actually talk about five different areas, um, sort of industries, that continue to look for the wisdom of people. So being 65 doesn't it, it's not a disadvantage, and that's in education, in financial services, in health care, in consulting, and in the tourism or, or sort of leisure area mm -hmm. where if you're wise, you have a skill set, you, know, you may own a business, you may have a franchise, you may continue to work in those areas. It, you know, they use sort of jokingly, I think it's a sad joke, that you know, you retire and you don't have enough money, you become a greeter at Walmart. Well, that's not true. There's many other opportunities that people who are ready to leave their current position um, could have. And there are more and more people working into their 60s and 70s that's right. these days just because of the realities of not having the money that they need to retire or to go on to another phase of their life or just maybe they enjoy. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, some are because they need to, others are because they enjoy it. That's they want to stay relevant. And, and again, the boomers, yeah. you know, we, we have an ego that we change the world. We want to continue to change the world. We're not ready to just walk off and go yeah. out to pasture, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. It used to be that, say, decades ago that once you reach 65 you'd get the gold watch and then you'd play golf or go down and fish or go down and and knit for a while but that you know you don't yeah. How many games of golf can you play before it's time to say, let's do something else? Exactly. Many of the people we interviewed, especially many of the men uh, that we interviewed who love golf or tennis or other things like that, had said before they retired that that's all they wanted to do. They just wanted time to do yeah. that. And about six months later, it was like, whoa, you know, what else is there to do? It, it doesn't mean that they walk away from playing golf. It just means that becomes more of a weekend or a midweek, but they want to continue. We want. Boomers want to stay relevant and they want to give back and they want to make a difference. I mean, they really have that value and the millennials have that same value, which is why they're, it's an interesting group. So here's a question for you. You've, uh, you have a rich background in finances, uh, financial expertise, and you speak to groups all around the country about this and other subjects. But when you talk to folks about retirement, what What's, say, the one thing that comes up the most often? What do people ask you about most often? Um, and I'm going to say finances are, yeah, are, are finances, one, but yeah. this is not a financial book. This is a lifestyle book. Okay. So I would say beyond that, and I always advise people to uh, how to talk to a certified financial planner and their attorney and their accountant to help them with that. Um, but the second thing is is really how do I follow my passion? How do I make my how do I do what I want to do in this next chapter, but also be aware I might need to continue to bring in money. So we have a number of exercises in the book that help people to 
first articulate what it is they really want to do. It's surprising, but many people get, all, it's almost like they have so many things they want to do, it's hard for them to understand what's most important to them. So the exercises we use help to get at that. And then once you do that, then you help them figure out, well, where do I go from there? And is there a way to continue to make some money doing, following this passion? And I'll give you a good example. We have a, a, a friend that went through one of our retreats. We do retreats um, four times a year in our homes, with gourmet food, and we only take between eight and 12 people. And it, it, those groups actually form support groups for each other. But one of them was uh, an attorney, a litigator from LA. And he was so you know, burned out, wanted to get out of the law. He just really didn't know what he wanted to do next. But he loved to bake. And he had his grandmother's um, macaroon and um, uh, chocolate brownie mixes. Well, now he's baking three days a week for some of the top restaurants in LA. And he's having a great time. And he's making actually quite a bit of money on that. And he's gone back to one day a week. He's doing law, but more as a pro bono kind of thing. So he keeps his finger in the law work. But he really is a baker today and having a wonderful time doing it. There are many other examples of people right. that do similar things. Uh, people here on Cape Cod, all around the country a friend who himself, he has done a number of things in his life, and he, but he's always liked to bake. Uh -huh. And he has been wanting, he discovered, came upon a recipe for a certain kind of bread that he always loved, and now he has a thriving business where he uh, he's really he's reinvented himself so, a, yeah. as a baker. So I, and, I love to hear those kind of stories. And you have yeah. some practical advice for people who want to, who, if you want to explore this kind right. of things, because I think a lot of people, it's like there are things that they wanted to do all their all their lives, but they haven't quite figured out how to do it, or maybe they don't have the courage to go ahead and do it. Right. And maybe it's just. Again, it's a different kind of mindset, reinventing yourself, like you, you, mm -hmm. the phrase that you use. Yeah. Well, well, there's a couple of things we advise people to do on that. One is we have one of the exercises is what we call a skills assessment. And we ask mm -hmm. people to fill out five skills that they have that they think are marketable in today's economy. So it might be a technology knowledge or skill. It might be that they're able to motivate people and to manage them in a, a way. But we have them write down those five, and then we have them go talk to people that know them and say, here's what I think are my five skills. Mm -hmm. What do you see? And it helps them to understand oftentimes a much broader set of skill sets that they have. And, and those are good to keep for your bio or to think about um, you know, what you want to do next. Um, then we suggest people go do informational interviews. If they think they might be want to be going back to your friend being a baker, go talk to some bakers. What's that life mm -hmm. like? What do they do? Um, sometimes you can get internships, free interns. Say, I'd like to come work for you for six weeks or two weeks just to see what you do. Uh, sometimes you get paid for that, but oftentimes you just go apprentice. Right. And then, it, you know, today, because of technology, there are so many opportunities in the food industry, in the uh, writing industry, and in doing blogs, in uh, ways that you can be located anywhere, but you can create a business. And through the internet, you can sell goods and services through the internet. You might sell them locally, but you can also do things out of your home that you can package and send uh, all over the world. And these things, you just have to, to do it. Right. You can't wait for somebody to come to you right. because there are, like you say, 10,000 people turning 65 each day. Right. You've got to get out there and do it. Right. Yeah. And for a lot of people, that's, uh, that's a scary thing. It is, um, especially for people that have worked, say, in one field or one, especially one company for a long time, they've, their life has been prescribed in many ways by right. what the job required or what their bosses wanted them to do. In a way, this next phase of your life, you're more an independent operator. You have to take more responsibility for not only what you want to do, but making it happen. And you make a good point. You, no one's going to come along and say, oh, I want you to do X. You have to think about, I really want to do this, mm -hmm. and how am I going to make that happen? And those are different skills. We all have the skills. but. It, it's a different skill set that you have to draw upon as opposed to being in a, a job that was pretty prescribed for you.
You're watching Books on the World, a presentation at the Cape Cod Writers' Center. The book is Revolutionary Retirement, What's Next for You? The co-author is Katherine Allen. The book has a number of chapters, just uh, invigorating reading, actually. And one of the things you talk about, retirement robbers. What are retirement robbers? Well, let's start with they're yourself. Ah, okay. and, and that's your <clears throat> inability to say no to whatever people ask you to do graciously, or it might be your guilt about, I don't deserve this time off. It might be your uh, a messaging from past that says you're being selfish if you're thinking about what you want to do. Mm -hmm. So the first place you have to start is thinking about yourself, that you've worked, you've deserved this time to think about what you want to do next. Um, it's not being selfish. You really do need to think about what makes you happy and what how you can follow your passions. And then you, you need to say, to do that, I have to create time. I have to give myself that gift of time, and I've got to set boundaries so that I'll have that time. And an example of some of the external robbers might be your, your children who come and say, gee, I would like for you to you know, babysit every day you know, from 12 on. Or it's your neighbor who says, I really need for you to fix this for me. Or it's a nonprofit that you know, can absorb a lot of your time doing volunteer work. You may want to do that, but it has to be a conscious decision. You mm -hmm. have to say, I need this amount of time because my passion is painting or writing or reading or traveling, and I then also have this time. So the way you might approach it is to your, your children or your daughter say, I would love to babysit my grandchildren and I can do it on Wednesdays and Fridays. Or I would really like to volunteer in the food kitchen and I can do it on Tuesdays. Um, uh, but you put boundaries around that. And then you also learn to say no graciously, which yeah. is thank you so much of thinking about me. I really am honored that you've asked me to do this. but. I just don't have the time right now to do it, but I know someone who might be yeah. able to. And saying no, so a lot of people have difficulty saying That's no. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I, I uh, have, have friends who say they have retired, but they also say that they're busier than they've ever been before, right. but they don't have time, they say, to, uh, to do all the things that they want. Yeah. 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 And, and, and again, it's because they have it. The first step is to think about what you're really passionate about doing in this time, in this next chapter, and then secondly, to set those boundaries that allows you to do that. Yeah. One of the things you talk about in the book, you have a chapter on leaving your legacy, mm -hmm. and you say that a lot of folks, that, that's important. We, every single person, every single boomer that we interviewed for this said they wanted to leave a legacy. And I think that, that again, that's part of the value system of the boomers who were born in 64, or from 46 to 64. We, we were after World War II, we came into a very, a time of a lot of growth in the United States mm -hmm. and good jobs for our parents. Um, during the 60s, we, you know, rebelled against institutions, whether it was, you know, not being able to wear jeans or, or how our institutions um, uh, governed. And so our generation has always been revolutionary about that. But one of the consistent things we always had was making a difference, changing the world, being involved. And so when we went back and talked to boomers about this, they all wanted to leave something. They wanted to make a difference. It didn't always mean money. It meant they might want to mentor, leave a legacy in the way they mentored people, leave a legacy of their value system, mm. leave a legacy in, um, it might be writing a memoir or doing a video or making a quilt. It might be endowing a chair at a university or, or you know, having a brick on the sidewalk at the, your university. But in some way, we wanted to leave an endowment. And one of the things, um, I'm actually a tri-chair. I went to University of Missouri undergraduate, and I'm um, tri-chairing a capital campaign that we have uh, going on now. And to date, many of our donations have been from baby boomer owned businesses or foundations whose children didn't want to continue the business in Springfield, Missouri, but they wanted to leave a name. And so they're endowing chairs or endowing a building and they, they want to give to education and they want to make a difference. Uh, and it's leaving the legacy out of these businesses. Very interesting. So uh, quickly summing up, if uh, somebody says, uh, Kathy Allen, what are the major things I need to think about about retirement? 
What do you tell them? So number one is finances and planning for that so that you know, do you have, it's not even a matter of, I don't ask the question, do you have enough? The issue is, am I keeping myself relevant and I'm investing in myself to continue to bring in revenue in some way? So the financial part of it. The second is the planning your lifestyle, thinking about where do I want to live, who do I want to live close to, uh, what do I want to do, what are my passions that I might want to follow on that? Mm -hmm. And the third is this legacy issue, that what do I want to, how do I want, my life to be um, thought of? How do, what do I want to leave to either my children, my grandchildren, my community, my colleagues about who I am? So leaving a legacy is very important. Yeah, leaving a legacy. I think uh, a lot of folks have always said they want to leave something behind, something of quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So th this book has a number of practical exercises. You also have, what I found was quite interesting, you have resources to access. Mm -hmm. uh, and how did you go about assembling the various resources that you did? So each of, the way we wrote this book is each of us took certain chapters to write the first draft of it. Mm -hmm. We all brainstormed about what the themes would be and what points we wanted to get across. Then we each wrote chapters and then we edited each other. Then edited you edited each, each other. other, yes. And in each case, we all would try to research and bring websites or ideas uh, that you could access um, that would help, whether it was books or articles or websites or ex other exercises and um, just one of the things one of the pieces of advice I'll give is um, we talked to HR people also and they said HR human resources, human resources, human resources that it was people. really important for people to be on LinkedIn if you're looking at continuing your career in some way they if they considered you for either full-time or part-time work if you weren't on LinkedIn now LinkedIn is a website that's yeah, a Link website it's a it's a, a media sort of a social media yeah. where you can exchange information and be kind listed. Kind of like Facebook for business That's folks. right. Yeah. Facebook for business is a good way to say it. Yeah. But if you weren't on there, they thought you weren't technologically, in, uh, you, that you didn't understand technology, and so that they were less interested in you than, than being that. So we talk about that again in the book and how important that is there. But there's lots of, there's lots of wonderful resources out there, and we support them. The book is called Revolutionary Retirement. What's next for you? Marvelous read, very easy to read, and you can pick it up and read a chapter or two and as practical advice. The co-author is Catherine Allen, and Catherine Allen, a pleasure, Kathy, talk to, it's a pleasure to meet you and talk to you. Thank you so much, and thank, thank you. you for having thank me you. on. Thank you, again, and thank you for watching Books and the World, a presentation at the Cape Cod Writers' Center. To learn more about writing or books or reading, visit your local library, and you can also contact the Cape Cod Writers' Center that are on the web at capecodwriterscenter.org. I'm Dan Tridel. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day. So thank you.